His Excellency S. R. Nathan, Ambassador of Singapore to the United States, spoke before the Council on March 25, 1992, at the World Trade Center, Baltimore. The title of Ambassador Nathan's address is Singapore-United States Relations, the Quest for Stability and Prosperity. Introducing the speaker is Dr. Frank A. Byrd, President, Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs. Our topic tonight, as you know, is Singapore-U.S. Relations, the Quest for Stability and Prosperity. Our guest, as you also know, is His Excellency, Mr. S. R. Nathan, the Ambassador of Singapore to the United States. Singapore uh, enjoys a reputation for uh, a serious quest for economic stability and uh, political stability. Singapore is very active, as you know, uh, in the region. It's a major player in uh, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. And uh, because of that, he enjoys a very cordial relationship with the United States. She plays an interesting role in the quest for regional order and global order. Our guest, the ambassador, began his career as a civil servant, specializing largely in the labor movement related matters. He was in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as the Deputy Secretary. He served as the Secretary of the Ministry of Home Affairs. He was the Director of a Division in the Ministry of Defense. And he was the first Permanent Secretary in the Foreign Ministry from 1979 to 1982. And from 1982 to 1988, he served as the Executive Chairman of the Straits Times Press Limited which is the company which publishes Singapore's major newspapers. In 1988, he was appointed as Singapore's High Commissioner to Malaysia. And then in September of 1990, became Ambassador of Singapore to the United States. It's my great pleasure to present to you His Excellency, Mr. S. R. Nathan. Thank you, Frank. Ladies and gentlemen, firstly, I want to thank the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs for arranging this opportunity to meet so many of you. Secondly, I want to make a few remarks about us, namely Baltimore and Singapore. We may be located in the different corners of the world, you in the Atlantic, and we astride the Pacific and Indian Oceans. We both share somewhat similar origins. They lie in our maritime activities. We are both uh, vital links to our respective hinterlands. Over the years, we have serviced world trade and in the process grown ourselves. You are an industrial city as well as a commercial hub. We too have become the same in our region. So we have therefore many shared experiences and interests. Thirdly, I want to say that I shall endeavor to address you today on the topic that you have given me by trying to answer four questions. Firstly, what is the nature of our relations? Second, how has the United States promoted stability and prosperity in Southeast Asia? Third, what are the realities of today that we must both face? And fourth, what can we do to strengthen our stability and our prosperity? First, let me address the question of the nature of our relations. My country's relations with the, the United States goes back a very long way because our history has only been a hundred odd years. Our favorite story is that of the first American consul in Singapore, Dr. Joseph Ballestier. I believe he was the son-in-law of an American patriot, Paul, Paul Revere, 
who had a significant role in foreign affairs in his own way. <laughs> Incidentally, for those of you who have not been to Singapore, I'd like you to know that there is a long and busy street named after Dr. Ballastier, known as Ballastier Road. That apart, there is depth and variety in our links. Our leaders value the relationship and the bonds of our friendship. Our links are also buttressed by several other important roots. Firstly, we share a common appreciation of our close political, economic and strategic relationship. Secondly, there is a common perception of the value of making the Southeast Asian region a stable, better and more prosperous part of the Asia-Pacific. There is a commonality of purpose and interest in ensuring a continued U.S. presence in order to promote peace and stability, not only in our own region of Southeast Asia, but throughout the Asia-Pacific region. The United States is, after all, a Pacific country, as well as a respected member of the family of Asia-Pacific nations. Thirdly, our two countries are committed to the promotion of free trade and market economics. Singapore and the United States have both benefited from free trade and the entrepreneurial spirit and drive of our respective business communities. A free trade environment has benefited us in the past and its preservation can only help us to benefit in the years ahead. Beyond the government, there is a web of contacts which reflects this common interest. There is a constant exchange of people. Tourists from Singapore visit the United States in large numbers, especially in the, to the West Coast. Americans take in Singapore in their travels to East Asia and Southeast Asia. Now, how has the United States promoted stability and prosperity, both in Singapore and in Southeast Asia? Today, you are Singapore's largest trading partner and also the leading investor in Singapore. Singapore is the 12th largest trading partner of the United States. In 1991, total two-way trade was about US $21 billion. Trade with the United States accounts for about 17.5% of Singapore's global trade. The major items of two-way trade are aircraft and aerospace equipment, electronic goods, chemical products, computer systems and peripherals, and tele telecommunication equipment. 96% of American exports enter Singapore duty-free. 55% of Singapore's exports to the United States are taxed on entry. As the largest source of foreign investments into Singapore, total American investments in Singapore amounted to $4 billion at the end of 1990. American companies commit, uh, committed more than U.S. $600 million in new investments in 1990. These investments were concentrated in the electronics and chemical sectors. Approximately 800 American companies operate in Singapore, accounting for 33% of total foreign investments in Singapore. It is estimated that U.S. firms employ more than 95,000 workers in Singapore or about 8% of our workforce. The value of U.S. investments have been different from that of other investors. American companies have a good track record on employer-employee relations in Singapore. They have shown themselves to be upfront in technology transfer. They have helped develop local managerial talent and corporate skills. Above all, they have also been receptive to our aspirations to promote industry-related research and development activities in Singapore. Beyond Singapore, U.S. economic penetration has also extended to other countries of the ASEAN region. Collectively, ASEAN has become the third largest overseas market for American exports after, after Japan and the European community. Total U.S. trade with ASEAN amounted to $50 billion last year. Of this, American exports to ASEAN in 1991 totaled 21 billion. Exports to ASEAN countries have also increased by almost 50% since 1988, 
a rate of growth far exceeding the growth of other U.S. trading partners in the region. If you use the measurement adopted by several U.S. government agencies and private sector organizations, namely that a $1 billion worth of exports creates 20,000 jobs in the United States, this should mean at least 400,000 jobs are sustained by your exports to the ASEAN countries alone. This holds out promise for even more American jobs being created in the future. Although ASEAN-US trade is already significant, it is recognized both here in the US and in ASEAN that for further development of these economic relations, there's a need for more and more US companies to be made conscious of the trade and investment opportunities that exist in Singapore and in the region, and which they must exploit. The latest effort in increasing economic relations between us is a series of business seminars currently being conducted jointly by all the American ambassadors accredited to ASEAN countries. The ambassadors are visiting Portland, Chicago, Detroit, Atlanta, Houston, New York, and Washington, D.C. The primary purpose is to promote an awareness among American businessmen of the market of 320 million people and the opportunities they offer to the U.S. in the region. This is the first time such an, in such an initiative has been mounted. Likewise, ASEAN ambassadors in the United States have also actively undertaken similar initiatives. We have visited a number of states in your union and continue to address various business promotion seminars organized by the ASEAN US Business Council and other American organizations. And in each of these, we urge them to invest time and effort to take advantage of the opportunities that exist in the region and develop their competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis other countries in the global marketplace. Beyond ASEAN, you often hear of the Asia-Pacific Asia region as a whole, as being the leading economic partner of the U.S. United States trade across the Pacific is now more than $80, $80 billion higher than trade with Western Europe. If present trends continue, by the year 2000, the ASEAN countries, China, Indochina, Hong Kong, South Korea, and Taiwan would have a combined GDP of U.S. $3.3 trillion, two-thirds of U.S. 1990 GDP, or half of the GDP of the European community in 1990. If Japan is included, the East Asian GDP would equal that of the United States. The region would therefore be even more important as an economic partner to the United States than it is today. I want to add another vital contribution that the United States has made in promoting stability and enhancing our, pros our economic prosperity. It is that, the that of the American involvement in Vietnam which helped the check, uh, to check the spread of communism and prevented the destabilization of the ASEAN countries, that is, those who are Vietnam's neighbors. By engaging Vietnam, the, the United States gave the ASEAN countries 15 years of breathing space to focus on economic development and consolidate the free market economic system and the industrialization process. The economic growth achieved by the ASEAN countries today is an important result of that American determination to prevent the spread of communism in Southeast Asia, a region vital to the interests of the United States and its allies in the Cold War. The case for US con continued U.S. Uh, military presence in Southeast Asia continues to be made in the region. It cannot only be made on the basis that we need you there. The United States should remain in the region because it is in your national economic and security interest to do so. Economically, the United States should not lose its market share of a group of countries with the world's fastest growing rates of growth in recent years and with whom it has always maintained a close economic and political relations for mutual benefit. Geopolitically, the ASEAN countries continue to remain of great strategic importance to the United States in terms of the strategic access to the sea lanes connecting the Persian Gulf, the Indian Ocean, and the Pacific Ocean. The American bases in the Philippines may, longer be there, may no longer be there. To some extent, they have been replaced by the access given to the United States, by Singapore, and possibly by other ASEAN countries.
to the facilities that they have. During a period of budgetary pressure to reduce your defense forces, this excess helps the United States to maintain a cost-effective power projection and rapid deployment capability of U.S. naval and air assets into the crucial or critical Persian Gulf and Indian Ocean area. The usefulness of continued American presence in Southeast Asia and the privileged access to facilities in the ASEAN countries was amply demonstrated during the recent Gulf War. The United States was able to move its naval and air forces much quicker from the region to the Persian Gulf than if these were based in the U.S. mainland. Singapore is midway between Guam and Diego Gracia and is thus strategically sited. Now, what are the realities of today that we must all face? Today, the reality is that we are in an increasingly interdependent world where economic and commercial relations are going to assume an even greater significance. As Professor Robert Reich says in his book, The Work of Nations, borders will become even more meaningless in economic terms. And I like to quote an extract from his book. And I quote, We are living through a transformation that will rearrange the politics and economics of the coming century. There will be no national products or technologies, no national corporation, no national industries. There will no longer be national economies, at least as we have come to understand that concept. All that will remain rooted within national boundaries are the people who comprise the nation. Each nation's primary assets will be its citizens' skills and insights. Each nation's primary political task will be to cope with the centrifugal forces of the global economy which tear at the ties binding citizens together, bestowing ever greater wealth on the more skilled and insightful while consigning the less skilled to a declining standard of living. The structure of industrial production, which has changed dramatically in the five decades since the Second World War, will change even further. Today, products contain various components from many different countries. Often, the key component, either in the form of a microchip or a silicon wafer, is manufactured in the United States. Despite fears to the contrary, you have preserved your technological edge and advantage while allowing less developed countries like us to produce certain components for your final products. As economists will tell you, such international division of labor contributes immensely to the efficiency of your production process and in keeping your cost of production down and helping the growth of your share of world trade. Further, such activities also bring goods and services within the reach of the average citizen worldwide. By the continuation of this cooperation, the prosperity of the United States will also be preserved while benefiting other Asia-Pacific countries. The debate in your country today about loss of jobs and creation of jobs have not taken into account the real benefits of such international diversification of skill and production. Sooner than later, we must all begin to appreciate that this element of industrial cooperation is for our mutual benefit. Singapore itself may be a relatively small market for American exports. However, the attraction of Singapore is that it is an ideal staging post for American companies to get into Southeast Asia and the marketplace in the area. Like Baltimore, we have been a regional hub since our founding. Our niche has been that we are able to help and service anyone setting up shop in Singapore to reach out to the markets in the neighboring countries such as Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, Philippines, Brunei, and Indochina. Through the years, Singapore businessmen have also established excellent networks with their counterparts in these countries and also in China, India, Japan, Korea, and other Asia-Pacific countries. Now, what can we do to strengthen our stability and prosperity? How can the countries of, in the Asia-Pacific and the United States maintain and improve on the existing good relations that they enjoy with each other? For a start, we should examine the basis that underpin the rapid industrialization of the countries of East Asia. They are the free trade system as, embo as embodied in GATT and the security and stability in Asia-Pacific provided by the U.S. military presence. 
It is necessary, therefore, to preserve these underpinnings in order to ensure that our relations continue to flourish for mutual benefit. However, there are some disturbances which can undermine this scenario and which we need to address together. Firstly, the Uruguay round of multilateral trade talks. A failure of the round could dismantle the entire GATT structure. World trade will be set back and the regional trading blocks will emerge. Such a development would slow world economic growth with adverse impact on all of us. The worldwide consequences will increase the likelihood of conflicts as rivalries <coughs> grow over resources such as the Middle East oil or other important factors of production. Secondly, the U.S. improves its international uh, competitiveness. Unless the U.S. improves its international competitiveness, it will lag behind economically and lead to severe cutbacks in American military presence in the Pacific, Asia Pacific area and a reduction in its capability to protect its interests in the region. Thus, in turn, would lead, this in turn would lead not only to a reduction of U.S. political influence in the region, but also weaken its ability to promote peace and stability. Thirdly, U.S.-Japan relations could worsen as friction generates over economic issues and eventually spills over to political and security relations. Unless the United States raises its competitiveness and recovers economically, American defense spending overseas will become an increasingly critical domestic political issue. There would be increased pressure for the United States to withdraw militarily from the Asia-Pacific region. Should this happen, Japan would seek to rearm and carry more of its own defense, including the protection of its vital sea lanes of communication and trade. This in turn, China, South Korea, and others in the Asia-Pacific area would speed up their own military buildup. The impact of such a development would be to divert the focus of the rest of East Asia away from economic development and sacrifice economic growth for military security. The quest for economic prosperity is therefore likely to be hampered and this is also going to impact negatively on the United States. How can such negative developments be prevented? Singapore believes that the Uruguay round should not be allowed to fail. To bring success to the round, every country must work for the success of the round for its long-term national interests. The United States should take the necessary steps to, to improve its own competitiveness and build on the opportunities that are available in the Asia-Pacific region. We believe others in our part of the world also hold similar views. We hope the American people will not ignore this need in their quest for our mutual stability and prosperity. Thank you. Uh, the question concerned uh, the details of Singapore law. And the, uh, the question is, will uh, what appear to us to be rather strict uh, restrictions upon the citizens of Singapore, such as uh, chewing gum restrictions, be liberalized. And, ha and long hair. And long hair, yes. <laughs> well, I probably must take you back a bit further away. We have been ind independent for just 25 years. As you know, when the flower people come, came around, that was not many years ago, long hair was a fad. In history, I think in times of Shakespeare, you saw a lot of sketches with people having nice fine hair, well combed, well preserved, and nobody gr grudged it. But what happened during the years of Greenwich was that you had a lot of people with unkempt hair and associated with the drug culture. So that was the first reason why we said no long hair, not only for our citizens, even for foreigners, we had some very good pop groups coming. We said, you don't perform unless you cut your hair. <laughs> but some decided to take a net, cover their hair and put on a hat and you couldn't see their long hair. But I think that fad is also changing. I think more and more, you see even the United States, more well-cut heads. <laughs> now I will come to the question of chewing gum. I know it's a difficult one to answer, but let me try. I gather that the Statue of Liberty 
also has a lot of chewing gum stuck on it and millions of dollars are spent scraping it every year. Likewise, I'm told that uh, Walt Disney's, uh, uh, what you call, Disneyland, don't sell chewing gum, for obviously good reason. But that apart, I give you my reason. We used to sell, in fact, we used to sell, uh, you know, gutta picha, from which chewing gum is made, from Singapore. But we have banned it. Why did you do it? Maybe it's too excessive, but nonetheless, it, there was a need to do it. Initially, vandalism took the form of sticking gums on bus seats and cinema theatre chairs where ladies' dresses got caught and, you know, some had to be, you know, uh, torn away and what have you. Then this moved on to bus seats. Subsequently, as you know, 85% of our population are housed in public housing. These houses have uh, elevators which take you to different floors. Gums were stuck onto the elevator button and people couldn't use the elevator. Then we have also got uh, public telephones located in various parts of the island. Either gums were stuck onto these uh, telephone buttons or to the slot where you put in your, your card and you couldn't use the public telephone. And many people are inconvenienced. But the worst is yet to come. <laughs> As, you, as those of you who have been recently to Singapore would have known, we have got a mass rapid transport system, an underground train system, which is fairly modern and I'm told uh, state of the art. Now they stick gums onto the door. Now sticking gums onto the door prevents the door from closing. It just closes and opens up again. Now if that were to disrupt just a particular coach or a train, perhaps we could have remedied it. The effect of it is disastrous because as a whole chain of events take place, the whole train service of that train is stopped and subsequently all other trains in, the, in every location is stopped because it's all electronic, uh, computer, computerized. So the, the, da the damage of it, the effect of it has been far more widespread. Now, our people, some chew chewing gum, others chew beetle nuts or beetle leaf. But the, those who chew chewing gum are not very many. But nonetheless, uh, we have passed this law. Uh, it looks ridiculous in, uh, from afar, but I think the bulk of the Singaporeans have accepted it. Perhaps some young people haven't, but they have accepted it because it has prevented an inconvenience. Now, I suppose if you walked in with a few bars of chewing gum, I don't think anything will happen to you. But <laughs> the thing is that you sh the shops have been asked to remove chewing gum from sale, and you can't bring in big gifts of chewing gum for your friends. As a uh, add-on to the last question, the assertion is made that the government may appear to be authoritarian. The question is, would you comment on the extent to which your government depends upon the electorate? Well, internal self-government came to Singapore in 1959, and since then, every four to five years, we have held elections. And uh, through the parliamentary process, people are elected, and they... Uh, they are in Parliament, and government is formed under the British uh, Westminster system. Even those who are critical of us in the opposition choose to contest these elections. And therefore, one must assume that, uh, you know, the election process has not been, uh, what you call, uh, objected to uh, so far. So this, these are elected governments. As to whether we are authoritarian or not, I think it's a relative term. I believe in the 1930s, when you had your slum, you had companies who had their own policemen went around taking around people. You were also authoritarian at your time. But ours is not, I don't say, say that we are in any way uh, you know, authoritarian in that sense. We had a serious communist problem. And there was an insurgency which sought to overthrow the governments of Malaysia and Singapore by violent means. There are laws that the British promulgated before they handed over to us called the Internal Security Act under which people were arrested and there was a process by which they were detained. And the process provides for uh, the, the persons to be brought before a lawyer, for the judge, for an advisory council to advise them or advise the, the authority and for these detentions to continue. 
it's difficult to say what constitutes authoritarianism. Uh, some people don't like you to uh, enforce certain laws and they think you are rather harsh on others. But sometimes these are necessary. Everything has a trade-off and I find it very difficult to address in specific, unless you specifically say in what way we are authoritarian. By our standards or by yours? Perhaps by yours maybe because you are free, you have been free for 200 years and over the process many things have happened and you are already a United State a country that's established, that has no prospect of being overthrown by the forces that we have seen. But in our case, we are just independent for 25 years. We are a multiracial society, Chinese, Malays, Indians. We are multi-religious. We are Christians, we are Buddhists, we have Taoists, we have Hindus, we have Zoroastrians, and you name it. We are multilingual. We speak Chinese, we speak English, we speak Malay, we speak uh, the variety of Tamil and Indian languages. And all these are explosive topics. And sometimes it's necessary to say what aspects of a dialogue will have to be curtailed. Because it's very easy to arouse racial tensions on the basis of race, language, or religion. And then if an explosion of that sort takes place, it's very hard on our part to say that we can curb it with any success other than by some authoritative means. <clears throat> the, que the observation was that Singapore purchases goods from the United States which we generally associate with Japanese expertise. And the question is, why are you buying those kind of products from the United States rather than from Japan? It is really a collab collaborative effort. Uh, we buy compon components on which we improve value added and we return it back to the United States. These are then combined into a product which you are then able to sell in world markets in competition with the Japanese. In fact, in this drive, I believe, you, you have edged the Japanese through this sort of process. Thank you. That the question was, uh, would you advise companies in Hong Kong to come to Singapore? Uh, let me preface my remark. The prosperity of Hong Kong has also benefited us because Hong Kong really serves its China hinterland and, and, and enables free trade to flow between China and the rest of the world. And it's prospered in the process. And through its the prosperity, there have been spillovers also to us. So I think it's in our vested interest to ensure that Hong Kong continues to be what it is. Uh, there may be difficulties at, in 1997. We hope it won't be anything very serious. We have tried to make a point by, uh, by offering to Hong Kong uh, residents I think to the extent, is it 25,000 families, a right to come to Singapore, obtain permanent stay without wa do, waiting for the, for the duration that normally one would require, and go back to Hong Kong to work there. And in the event of anything evil coming up in, uh, in 1997, they can't sustain it, they would be free to return to Singapore. And I think we've also made it known to China that these people who are valuable in uh, Hong Kong's economy today will also be valuable for China and how she handles them would also be in China's best interest. But we have offered this 25,000. And like us, others have also offered likewise, Canada, Australia, Britain, the United States and so forth. Of course, some have insisted on the minimum residential qualification. Others have uh, uh, given them a kind of blank uh, rain check to, to cash. Now, as a, as a business enterprise, you are risk takers. You are on the spot, I'm far away. I would assume that between now and 1997, that's about five years more, you would have a better feel of how things are. And we can only hope that uh, Hong Kong goes through that phase without any difficulty. From the investments that are pouring into Hong Kong, both Japanese and others, there seems to be a 
sense of confidence that things will turn out well. I think that's the barometer you would see and I would ask you to see. Would you, yeah, would you comment upon the refugee problem in Cambodia and uh, uh, Burma? At least the refugee par problem in Burma and the situation in Cambodia. Well, I think they're two, two questions, aren't they? I, mean, I, I can get the question on Burma quite clearly, but I'm not sure your question in Cambodia. Well, as, as part of a UN process, I think we have we have reached the point where uh, the UN has decided to send, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a peacekeeping force to prepare for elections. We are sending a contingent of what 75 police officers initially to go into Cambodia to help the process, and uh, we are working together with the UN on this matter. And in regard to to Burma, which they now call Myanmar. In regard to the uh, refugees who have flowed into Bangladesh, all the ASEAN countries have issued very strong statements condemning that action and urging the Burmese government to allow those people to return back. The question is to... You had remarked uh, during your presentation that the uh, diminution of the American presence in Asia would lead to a chain of events uh, in which... Uh, countries of all of Asia would uh, increase their standard, their, their military forces, a kind of arms race. And uh, I think the question is to ask you to amplify on the dynamics of, of, uh, of that arms race. Okay. I've got the, you've got the question. The, fir the first question is, what I did say is that given the economic problems that you face, there is liable to be pressure to cut down on your uh, defenses or your, your military presence in our part of the world. And if that should take place, then we will see uh, Japan rearming herself, which will then generate China, Korea, and others to want to rearm. And uh, that would bring about instability because there will be all sorts of forces trying to fill in the vacuum that the United States leaves. The second part of, the, of your question is, where is the threat? Now, we all like to believe that the Cold War ends today and tomorrow we are all in heaven. <laughs> the fact is, if you go back to the Cold War, when the war ended in 1945, the Cold War didn't begin in, in October 1945. The Cold War began three to four years later, after Berlin, after the airlift to Berlin, and then from there it began to build up. So like that, in this situation where we have had uh, the crumbling of the communist uh, of the Soviet Union and no doubt the adversary the Soviet Union has ceased in appearance that is the factor that things are unpredictable nobody is certain what's going to happen in that part of the world we are unclear what's going to happen in our part of the world namely you have the North Koreans with their nuclear capability some of them some of your media calls them rogue nations we have uh, tensions in our area. All uh, rivalries could revive, could uh, could uh, be revived. Uh, the other day there was some announcement about the Spratly Islands, which are claimed by a number of countries. So all these su su suggest a certain uncertainty. So what the point that I'm making is that it's not easy for us to identify at this time the form of threat to U.S. interests that will emerge. Maybe in two to three years' time, when things are much more improved, either the threats will disappear or the threats will emerge. If the United States is going to be able to meet this threat, then it must be in a position to respond to it as quickly as it emerges. 
So until that situation of certainty arises, it's incumbent on the United States, which has played the role so far, to preserve its ability to project its power. And that helps others to draw down some of the tensions that we now that now exist, which you one can't openly identify and say, you know, this is it or that is it, but they exist and they could blow up in the event of the US not being around. That's my point. The, uh, the question is related to the previous question, obviously. Um, and uh, the observation is that you observe that the countries of Asia would all benefit economically if they didn't waste their money on military uh, matters. Uh, and that would be nice if the United States would spend its money on military things to prevent that. And the question is, given that uh, situation, uh, would it not be fair for the beneficiaries, the Asian beneficiaries, to somehow reimburse the United States for its military presence? But I, uh, I like to say this, and that is our respective interests doesn't change with change of leadership, with change of regimes, with change of circumstances. They remain regardless, number one. Secondly, we all seek to protect our own interests. You didn't go to the Gulf only because of Saddam Hussein. You went also for other reasons of your own interests. So likewise, your presence in our part of the world also serves your interests, your strategic interests vis-a-vis -vis Japan and what have you. We, within the limits of our capability, have given some facilities. Japan, I think, has offered to pay something like 70% of the cost of your presence in Japan. If not now, maybe in a, in a few years' time. Others are planning to offer some facilities to be used. And the nature of your presence may not be as massive. The nature of your presence must, might, may change. With technology, with the speed with which you are able to move, things will change. So it's not going to be at the same cost that you're going to be present. So I, it's very hard for me to give you arithmetically an answer. But I think everybody is endeavoring to make it possible for you to pursue your own interests at the same time protect our interests. Would you comment upon the, uh, the defense of Singapore and who's primarily responsible in addition to the government of Singapore? Oh, you mean who is the threat, you mean? Uh, he, she, I think she's inquiring about the oh, nature who? of the defense okay. of your country, Singapore. Thank you, ma'am. Well, I must go back a little into history. <laughs> As you know, madam, we came, became independent overnight. We woke up one morning and then we say, we're independent. And under the Treaty of Separation, there is an obligation on the part of Malaysia to help defend us. But the lesson of contemporary history is defense against help. <laughs> so we have got to be able to defend ourselves. Now we can't because we are a city, largely an economic entity. Our manpower cannot be wasted with a standing army. So we have introduced national service. Now national service means two and a half years to three years of compulsory national service in the army. Those who are medically unfit and who cannot, you know, jump up and climb up the hills and so on, they do office work, but they wear uniform. All males at, from the age of 18 have to undergo two and a half years of national service, and they are of the officer rank a little longer. Now, this also helps us to bring together our own people. The rich and the poor have a common suffering in the army. <laughs> The Chinese and the Indians and the Malays also go into the army together. The better educated and the less educated also go into the two and a half years. So by that process, you have a whole generation of young people suddenly being brought together to share, if they might, they might say, their, their, their burden in the process of, of, the, of an army life. And hopefully by that, they develop relationships their own identity. So nation building is also part of that process. 
but essentially the purpose of defense is defense against help. <laughs> How did Singapore go from a population problem to an, another population, a, a different population problem? How did it go from a, uh, a an excessive population to uh, a population which wasn't quite large enough? When we began, I think uh, what was our rate of growth? Four point. 4.5% rate of growth of population. We had only, uh, you know, we, we had a serious housing problem. We had a serious unemployment problem, more than 10% unemployed. We had uh, unrest. It was, we had a limited land space, and we felt that it was necessary to have population control to ensure that this land that we have can be beneficial to all of us because if we spread to anything like four to five million at that time we would have become a concrete jungle and we would have really no not much space so there were good economic and social reasons why we tried to uh, encourage families to cut down now with economic prosperity and more women at work i think primarily women have been influential in wanting to have small families and we have almost zero growth now but we are now faced with a labor shortage <laughs> i believe other countries have gone through france has gone through they pay children's allowances for you to have children so i suppose it's the nature of things it's like us i suppose when we are poor we we, 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 we tighten our belts, we don't do this, that, the other, then suddenly we become affluent, you know, why did I do all this? So, it's the nature of things. The, uh, the observation was that Malaysia has uh, suggested the forming, formation of a kind of uh, uh, Southeast Asia economic union or a tighter group, and the United States apparently is unhappy about that. Would you comment on that situation? Um, I think this refers to the proposal by the Malaysian Prime Minister to form what is known as a, a East Asian Economic Caucus. Originally it was called a group and now it's called a East Asia Economic Caucus. The primary purpose of this caucus that has been proposed by Malaysia is that it should be a consultative, it is a, a consultative body. It will be GATT consistent, it will be for free trade, and it will not be a block. Now, in so far as this caucus is concerned, why has this idea emerged with, in, with him? The European community is now uh, getting together, and it will be whatever they might call a block in, in itself. There is NAFTA coming up with prospects of other Latin American companies coming in, and there's a prospect of a larger American entity arising, although the U.S. government has assured us that uh, this will be open and it will not be a block that will exclude others. Now, while these are going on, the suggestion was that we should have a, some way by which countries of East Asia should be able to consult each other over these developments. The United States believes that there is the APEC, the Asia-Pacific Economic uh, Community, uh, which the, you, the U.S. Is, pro is actively promoting, and that should be enough. That extends to Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and so on. So it's really a consultative group about which we have no objection because, I mean, in this gathering, a few of us can always get to one corner and consult each other. Uh, only thing in this one, there's a name. There are, there, the Europeans are in a consultative status. The, the, uh, within the EEC, you have uh, the Scandinavians together, they have a consultative group, or they don't label it as such. So from that process, we, are, we feel it's something we can go along so long as it is a consultative caucus, so long as it is GATT consistent, so long as it's not intended to be a block. I mean, that's the Singapore position, and I think we, we go along with that. Now, as to the U.S. concerns, I'm afraid I'm not in the State Department to answer you. Would you uh, describe the uh, environment for an American corporation in Singapore? 
I wish there was somebody from some American MNCs here who can answer you that question. We have no restrictions whatsoever. They can send their, their profits abroad. They can bring their managerial uh, talent to manage the company. Uh, they can export whatever they want. Uh, they live in very peaceful surroundings. They've got very good schools for their children to go to. I, I, I know of no restriction. And the ambassador thanks you for that question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Would you comment upon the uh, uh, American uh, Singapore understanding on uh, military facilities in Singapore? Well, as you know, we are only uh, 260 odd, uh, 60 square miles together with the reclaimed area. And we have a population of almost 3 million proceeding to perhaps 4 in due time. So even if we wished, we couldn't take on Subic. So what we have offered is facilities for some uh, aircraft to come from Korea or from Japan to rotate in Singapore and go back so that these facilities are available to the United States should a need arise. The second is that there is a naval uh, logistics element in Subic which looks after the deployment of naval ships, their victualling, their repairs, their training and so forth. Now that element has been offered a place in Singapore and the details of which have to be worked out. But I think in the, in the, with the nature of developments and the uh, drawdown of some of the more serious threats, perhaps the United States is satisfied with this limited facility with us, which they hope to uh, also have elsewhere within the region and I believe they must be in discussions with others. So the, 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 if one read the statement, you have certain base facilities in Korea and Japan and perhaps uh, uh, in, within in the, the, in the US. And then you have these excess facilities, which are limited in, 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 in scope. Is there a drug problem in Singapore? And if so, how do you handle it? I think there's a drug problem everywhere. And we are an international center. And uh, therefore, uh, there is uh, every prospect of it worsening if it's allowed to grow. We have been very severe about drugs right back from the, la from the 70s when it started with marijuana and then has moved on to one thing or another to cocaine and so forth. We have a law which I think many Americans will not approve of and that is if you carry, if you possess drugs, beyond a certain quantity. What's the how old size? 20 grams uh, and uh, of heroin or whatever it is. You are liable to a mandatory death sentence. No, let me explain to you. I think the perp there, there are two things, two or three things here that we have to bear in mind. There are those who are the victims of drug, you know, who require, me who require re uh, tr medical treatment and rehabilitation. That is, those who consume it. Now, those, once we have, uh, we have, we have uh, identified them and picked them up, they are sent through a process of medical uh, rehabilitation and then sent out back into society. You'll, you'll be surprised to know we, are, we have such a thing as a, as a urine bank. I'll tell you what it is. You see, we are contiguous to the Malaysian mainland or elsewhere. Then the people can go to across the causeway, have a smoke or whatever it is, a jab, and then come back. So when we are suspicious of anybody, we ask them to go through this process. Two bottles of urine is filled in their presence, sealed, witnessed by somebody, and put into a bank. And then one of it is sent to be analyzed while the other one is kept just in case anybody says my urine sample was changed. So that's the origin of the, of the urine bank. This is in regard to protecting us, the consumers. And this is a deterrent effect with many, especially young children, those who are under stress, those who are in the army and so forth. So those who are found uh, consuming, uh, being victims of it, they go through this process. But the two other elements that are more evil than these, these are the pushers, the ones who really contaminate our society, 
who, in order to make some money, push drugs, distribute the drugs. And then there are the kingpins, who are respectable gentlemen, whose hands are never stained, but who manipulate the market. Now, this deterrent act is meant against the other two. We have, we have in fact, sentenced several. Many have gone to the gallows. It's kept it down. And the other thing we do is, those who transit Singapore and are found with, with, with uh, drugs suffer the same penalty. We have had instances recently of them using Nigerians or people from Africa to or what you call courier drugs. And they are in transit in the airport. They don't even get into Singapore. But if they are identified, they go through the same process. And uh, secondly, we have had people from Hong Kong or elsewhere going out. So we are we are we are in important uh, travel travel route, and so we help to uh, remove the spread of drugs this way as well. As well. Now, is draconian, Bepa? How effective have these laws been? Well, I think they have been. <laughs> there, there have been less and less people who have been carrying them. Uh, there are less and less who, have con who are consuming and coming across the causeway. I mean, I can't say I've eradicated it. It exists. But, I mean, there is, you know, when, when you have a, a, such a penalty, people will think twice or three times before they indulge in it. I mean, many of these are innocent. They probably say, you know, will you sell this for me? And then you start getting hooked up on it, and then you want more drugs, and then you start acting for, as a courier for the other person. So by this process, at least you have cut down the spread. And I think that by, by any reckoning, the, the drug population is a very small one. Would you comment upon your health system and uh, how your government uh, bolsters it? I, I've just come back from a coronary bypass. <laughs> so, so I think it speaks well for our, our, our facilities. It's working. Well, one of the things that uh, this government launched on was that we will provide socialist benefits through capitalist methods. <laughs> and that we have done faithfully for the last 25 years. We have privatized some of the hospitals. We are, I think, one of the major medical centers in the region. We have people coming from within the region, from the Gulf, from India, from wherever it is. So our facilities are very good. We have privatized some of them. But at the same time, anybody needing surgery, medical treatment, who cannot afford it, is not denied it. I mean, there's no question of asking for one's insurance before admitting him to hospital. Uh, I, I suppose this is uh, something that we, ourselves, Malaysia, uh, some of the countries in the region provide as a, as a matter of duty to, to our population. And when a person who is a non-paying patient goes through a major surgery like me, post-surgery, he or she will remain in the same, what you call, intensive care unit as I did. 